This is Mary Bobo of the U of L Oral History Project. Today is April 16, 1979. I'm talking with Mr. Joe Hammond. Mr. Hammond was born March 26, 1916 in Bardstown, Kentucky. He presently resides in Louisville, Kentucky. His parents were Mary Rose Hammond and Walter Hammond. Mr. Hammond, at this time, could you give me some idea of when you came to Louisville and the circumstances under which you um, came to this city? Well, my parents, uh, it was their decision, I'm sure. They decided to move to Louisville when I was approximately four years old. So we did. We moved to Louisville. And um, as I remember, the father had a, quite a hard time during that time of finding employment, gainful employment. So we were a poor people, poor family. But eventually, he did find an, a job and um, began working. And of course, I came up uh, as a result in uh, Catholic school. I was born, uh, reared really in the eastern part of the city called uh, Smoketown. And I went to school there, an elementary school at uh, St. Peter Claver Catholic School, which I finished the elementary school and went on to at that time, which was called St. Mary's or Catholic Colored High School on 8th Street, which was a Catholic school. And I finished my high school education there. After that, I thought possibly that I might want to go to Pittsburgh, thinking that maybe I would go to school there, but circumstances were such that I didn't. So as a result, it was, of course, just high school education. With only a high school education, Joe B. Hammond would not be discouraged, but would faithfully step out into the world. I had a job as a lifeguard up until the, of course, the season closed. I think I remember getting a job uh, for Gordon's potato chip factory, frying, frying potato chips at night. Then, 1937, I guess it was, the flood, of course, came. And at that time, I was living in the Highlands. So I was not affected by the flood, but immediately after the flood, I was able to get a job at the Louisville Gas and Electric Company. So I worked at the gas and electric company until 1944. I started as a laborer, I guess, for approximately six months, and then I began, became an apprentice lineman. And I did work as a lineman for four years. Then I was promoted to foreman. I remained a foreman for approximately three and a half years. Scotch, English, Jews, Italians, Negroes, all races, colors, creeds, but all Americans. Prior to 40, for when I went into the service, I volunteered. A uh, young fellow working out there who's but a very good friend, Clarence Anderson. The two of us volunteered and we joined the uh, CBs, joined the Navy and they put us in the CBs. So a lot of times the CBs, you know, they hit the beach early, they were able to construct, but other units to get to, once they arrive on the beach, they could continue to move. They build airstrips under pressure of time and the enemy. And when their work was interrupted, they fought. Joe, at that time, he believed in civil rights, and he fought for it. Being in the Navy or any military branch during World War II was not easy for African-American soldiers. Their rights were not equal to their white counterparts. And when racism and discrimination raised its head, another war was at hand. The battle would escalate for Joe and other black servicemen while stationed in Trinidad. Standing strong as a black man for his civil rights and others alike, Joe and other black servicemen would leave the base in protest for the mistreatment by white officers but only to receive a dishonorable discharge. But timing was on Joe's side, and so was the NAACP's chief attorney, Thurgood Marshall. Joe and others were later given their honorable discharges because the charges against them were dropped. Joe was involved in civil rights, you know, after the urban renewal, or even before urban renewal. He was part of an organization called the Allied Organization for Civil Rights, AOCR, and they brought Martin Luther King here for the March on Frankfurt in 1964, and he was the finance chairman. After fighting for his country and for civil rights, 
Joe would leave the military and return to the Louisville Gas and Electric Company until he got that entrepreneurial spark. And I decided that I wanted to go in business for myself, so I resigned from the Louisville Gas and Electric Company and went into the dry cleaning business. In 1944, Joe would also marry the true love of his life, Albertine Haley, also known as Pete, known to be a kind, loving, and caring wife, always supporting Joe in all his endeavors. Then the newly elected sheriff of Jefferson County, uh, Mr. Bernard Bax, he sort of persuaded me to join him in the sheriff's office as a deputy sheriff. That was something that I didn't like too well. I didn't like carrying a pistol or a badge either. And at that time I resigned and took a job as liquor salesman for Jefferson Distributing Company. Joe Hammond, when I think I became aware of who he was, I think Joe was um, selling uh, beer. He was a beer salesman for the Fall City Beer Company. I remained a liquor salesman for approximately a year when I was offered a job as a salesman for Fall City Brewery. At that time, I think the many companies thought it expedient to hire black salesmen along with the other salesmen, and they offered me the job, which I accepted. I remained with Fall City Brewery until October of 1954. And one of his customers was in Dave's Palm Room. Dave Snyder, a guy named Dave Snyder, a uh, Jewish fellow, owned the uh, the Palm Room there at 13th and the Magazine. David Snyder at that time was operating with what was known as Dave's Palm Room, which was located at 13th and Magazine Streets. And because of ill health, he consequently, he offered it to me to purchase and I bought it. That was in October of 1954. Joe eventually purchased the Palm Room from Dave and renamed it Joe's Palm Room. Well, Joe Hammond was part of the rise of black entrepreneurship in Louisville, and he was part of the rise of black entrepreneurship on Walnut Street. We were located in the urban renewal area, and due to the fact that we were having a difficult time finding a location, a suitable location, in fact, they let me remain at that location about two years beyond the time that most of the other places had been cleared out. Urban renewal, I know what it was uh, and what it did. I know, it, uh, I know that sections of that area were really the heart of culture for the African-American community. I mean, it was the clubs and the, uh, the entertainment and the shops and people, I mean, they could buy black, they could, they could get black doctors and black dentists and black lawyers and things of that sort. And urban renewal just kind of wiped out that whole area. That was, a, that was a removal of black entrepreneurs on Walnut Street, in which my father and my uncle both had businesses on Walnut Street. My, my uncle had the first retail record shop on Walnut Street, Davis Jazz Center. And my father and uncle also had the first black trade school, the David, Davis Trade School. Friends even that were in business at that time that were displaced by urban manure were not able to relocate their businesses, either because of lack of funds or not being able to find the proper locations or because they may have been able to get funding but not enough funding. My family's business did not survive urban renewal. Due to the fact that I had been in the urban renewal and had been displaced by the Urban Renewal, which was a federal agency. Uh, I qualified for a federal loan, which was SBA, Small Business Administration Loan. I was fortunate enough to obtain the loan and the necessary funds to clear off the property and build this particular building. Unfortunately, we had a problem with the people in the area here at this particular location where we are now. So after some two years of litigation and courts and so forth, we finally, the Board of Aldermen, uh, passed the zoning to C2, which gave us permission to build here and move into this location. So we came to this location in July of 1967. And you gotta understand, that establishment he had on Jefferson, I can't speak to the one on 13th, uh, it was a classy place. 
I mean, people didn't look at this as a joint. This wasn't a joint. This was a classy place. It was the place to play. It was the place to be where you really wanted to get the pulse of the community. Because not all blacks lived in the West End. Some were moving to the East End and to the other end of Broadway. But they all came back to Joe's. It was kind of the place to be. And, uh, you know, when you got a new suit, you showed it off to Joe's, you know. <laughs> when you got a new overcoat, you showed it off to Joe's. When you got a new girlfriend, you showed it off to Joe's, you know. So it was the place to be, and that's what made it popular. I think the first time I went to Joe's Palm Room, I don't remember the year, but I do remember running into my father, <laughs> which was, uh, <laughs> that was the last time he went to Joe's. And, you know, that was his place. That was where men that worked hard or came to relax after a hard day's work, and here comes his daughter. So that was the last time he went. You know, as a young kid, you know, we used to hang outside of Joe's Palm Room. Sometimes we'd go in, sometimes we wouldn't. But Joe's Palm Room was, you know, when you go in, it was it was the, I don't know if it's called the, the the Chitlin Circuit of the West End, but it was really an anchor of the West End. You could go in there and, and you see the guys that dress nice. You see the Mr. Hammonds. You see people that had a little clout, had a little wealth, and they're just having a drink and having a good time. You see the live band. You know, it, it, it was a great place to go. If you wanted to hang with the, the grown folks, that was what Joe's Palm Room was about. When he moved from 13 to Magazine, they moved to 19th and Jefferson. And I was in there every weekend. And me and him was in politics together, so we needed each other. He needed the crowd, and I was the man to get the crowd that for him. And I have been in politics since I was an early, or a very young man. And I've always done anything. And my sole reason for being in politics is what can I do for my community through politics? Uh, although he never tried for office, he would have won significantly, perhaps, been mayor. He was very important in the community. He was not only the center and a go-to kind of guy from the black community, but he was a connector to the majority community, particularly in the business area or in the political area as well. And Joe, Joe, and, them, Joe and them got together and Gatewood and them and made Stanberry High the first black fire chief he was my next door neighbor. See, Stan, they wanted a white boy, and they lent in Joe and him, said, we're not voting for you, letting you put him in. That's how we got the first black fireman. His name was Larry Bonifant. He was in power. He was the one in charge. You know, people came to see him. You know, and that's what I remember about him. And he would tell me, Merv, it's about connections. You gotta know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. He was a convener, uh, and also he was an encourager. Uh, he wanted to see young people succeed and give them advice on business or politics or uh, the tenor of things in the African-American community. So he was just a, a monumental figure. The result of, from my political activities, I think we have been able to do a lot of things, and I say we because this hasn't been just me, it's been we, a group of us, have worked very hard together uh, in politics for many years, and our sole purpose was to get as many things done for our community, not only the black community, but for the overall community that we possibly could. Joe B. Hammond, the man, the entrepreneur, husband, businessman, political and community leader. Could there ever be another like Joe B. Hammond?